In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. As always, it's great to be with you. And as always, we like to start off our day by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. We also pray to Mary in the beautiful prayer we say at the end of the Hail Holy Queen, and that is the, we say, Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's pray the prayer that, that Mary loves most, and that Prayer is the prayer of the Hail Mary, we also call it the angelic salutation. So together let's invite Mary to be with us as we say, as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So let's turn now to our spiritual director. Spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the paraclete. He's also known as the gift of gifts. He's also known as the sweet guest of our souls. The Holy Spirit is also known as the as the sanctifier. Holy Spirit is also known as Our consoler, our consoler as well as our counselor. Holy Spirit is our interior master or teacher. So let's ask the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light, a lot of peace a lot of joy, a lot of insight. As we pray the classical prayer to the Holy Spirit, and that prayer is, Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. O Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Francis Xavier, pray for us. 
Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska. Pray for us. Saint Teresa of Avila. Pray for us. All God's angels and saints. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So it's a great to be with all of you, and I'll pray for you. Some of you are posting uh, happy birthday to me, so thank you very much. And as Carmen pointed out, that uh, actually my birthday is, uh, my birthday is actually on February 29th. So technically this year I don't have a birthday. So what I usually do is when I don't have a birthday, I celebrate it actually two, I celebrate my birthday on two days, February 28th and March 1st. So I, I take advantage of the opportunity to celebrate a double birthday, no? So if you're asking me how, what my age is, I will say that I'm a year older than last year. I mean, I can say that. But technically, I'm 16 and three quarters, to be exact. 16 and three quarters. So... As you point out, Sweet 16, I had a, my quinceanera I celebrated for four years. So there's a certain advantage of being born on what is called leap year. So I'll pray for all of you on my birthday and I'll place you on the altar in the Mass that I'll celebrate, the Mass that I'll celebrate today. Right, the Mass that I'll celebrate today, I'll place all of you on the altar. Of course, there's no greater, there's no greater gift in the world than, or greater prayer in the world than the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. It's the prayer for par excellence, you might say. So, uh, I'll place you on the altar and I'll offer these intentions that God would bless you this holy season of Lent and that all of us would uh, try to be open and docile to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps we can say this short prayer that I've taught you over the years and it is, Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Thank you very much. Many of you are posting uh, happy birthday wishes. And uh, thank you very much. And I, I will uh, place you on the altar in my Mass that all of you would have uh, really a blessed, blessed Lent. A blessed life and that all of us will, will will go to heaven that's really why we're here that all of us will go to heaven and that's really why we're here we're here in this world a very short time to get to heaven so thank you very much and I'll play that I'll pray also for your loved ones that your loved ones who have possibly walked away from God, that they would return. You know, it's never too late. And my, my last intention, as always, I'd like to pray for the, I'd like to pray for the conversion and salvation of deathbed sinners, that those who will die within the next 24 hours until we meet again on our next Perseverance Family Meeting, that these people who are dying, that they will be saved because 
really the purpose of our life is to love God in this life and to die loving God so that we'll go to be with God forever in heaven. So thank you, Marie and Estella and Beatrice and Sophie and and all of you who have, uh, Carmen, all of you posted uh, these wonderful Lulu and Gerardo and Amalia and Jeff and Irene with her big group of people making the consecration, Geraldine, um, and uh, Lisa and Angela and Sophie and Lula, a lot of a lot of people, Maggie, Carmen, Cecilia, Marin Rendevado. Well, a lot of a lot of beautiful, beautiful um, Mary Jo. Thank you very, very much. And we'll pray for Mary Jo's uncle passed last evening, so I'll pray for her. Uncle passed away. He was, he was I think, 96. So we'll pray for him that if he's not in heaven, he'll be taken up to heaven through our prayer. So thank you very much. And thank you, Lucia, and the many other people who are joining us now. What a beautiful way to celebrate a birthday by coming together as a family in the Lord in which we pray together, we we um, learn together, we share together. So um, the, the first reading in the gospel today are the following. I told you uh, on Ash Wednesday that the, the readings we have on Ash Wednesday, especially the gospel reading, is going to set the tone. It'll set the tone for what we should be trying to put into practice to arrive at our conversion. And then in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, uh, Matthew chapter 6, he offers us three ways that we can arrive at a deeper conversion. And he mentions the importance of prayer. Then he mentions also the importance of penance or fasting. Then our Lord mentions also the importance of almsgiving. As uh, Father Al said in one of his homilies, we're called to go, it's the three-dimensional way of living out Lent. We're called to go up, in, and out. Up means through prayer. In means through penance. And out would be through almsgiving. Go, go up, go in, and go out. Go up, prayer, go in, penance, go out, almsgiving. So you're going to be seeing, during the course of these 40 days of Lent, a certain repetition of those basic themes. For example, yesterday's Mass, we had Matthew chapter 25, where our Lord said, we're going to be judged on the way we treat others. He says, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a foreigner and you welcomed me. Sick and in prison and you you visited me. When? Whenever we did it to the least of our brothers and sisters, then we do it to Christ. So that would be related more to almsgiving. Almsgiving, which means the way we treat others the way we treat others. So, you're going to see one of those three themes. So today in the readings, we have a very beautiful short reading from Isaiah. He says, Just as from the heavens, the rain and snow come down, and do not return there, till they have watered the earth, making it fertile and fruitful, giving seed to the one who sows and bread to the one who eats, 
so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall do my will, achieving the end for which I sent it. That's Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10 and 11, those two verses. So Isaiah is given this beautiful poetic image that when the rain comes down to the earth, it produces uh, fertility and plants and trees are brought forth. So the word of God is efficacious, is efficacious. Now, if we move from there to the gospel, the gospel today, the gospel today is, it's the, it's the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. In one of the versions, you have the Matthew version and the Lucan version. The Lucan version starts the apostles say, Lord, Lord, teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples how to pray. And from that, we have the Our Father. So we might even start off our conversation by saying, Lord, teach me how to pray. That is a very Lord, teach me how to pray. That is a, a very pleasing prayer to the Lord. Lord, teach me how to pray. Lord, teach me how to pray. And from that, the Lord says, when you pray, our, say, Our Father who art in heaven. Now, before dissecting this prayer and going through it, a word at a time. I would like to give you a couple of sources that you can read. To get to know better spiritually and theologically this prayer. So if you really want to go deeper in knowing the Our Father, you can read St. Cyprian made a commentary on the Our Father. St. Augustine made a commentary on the Our Father. Then one of the greatest commentaries ever written was by St. Teresa of Avila. And the name of that book is in Spanish, Il Camino de Perfection, The Way of Perfection. The Way of Perfection is one of the spiritual classics of Teresa of Avila. It was first written for the nuns in the convent, then it became a universal book, given that Teresa of Avila is a doctor of the church and she's one of the, one of the women doctors of the church. Actually, the first one to be proclaimed a doctor of the church was Teresa of Avila and then Catherine of Siena in 1970 by uh, Pope Paul VI. Also, you can go into the Catechism of the Catholic Church. You can go into the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the fourth part on prayer. The Catechism explains it in detail. Then, uh, in honor of St. Louis de Montfort in the, his spiritual classic called The Secret of the Rosary, St. Louis de Montfort explains the the Our Father and the Hail Mary in great detail. So those are several uh, bibliographic resources that you can utilize. Now, St. Ignatius Loyola gives us various ways that we can pray. Meditation, contemplation, vocal prayer, examination of conscience, meditate upon the capital sins. Ignatius gives a whole plethora, a variety of ways in which we can, we can pray. Another way is though you take the, a vocal prayer like the Creed, the Hail Mary, the Our Father, 
and just take it one word at a time and you say it slowly relishing the words. And that you might try to do today, taking the Our Father. <clears throat> so let's go into it. It's called, it's called the Lord's Prayer of the Our Father. So we start out with Our Father. Now he could have said My Father, but he said Our Father. What do we mean? What does he mean when when our when our Lord says, "Our Father"? What does he mean by saying "Our Father"? You know what it really is. It means this. I posted it for you. By our Father, it's a universal family. We're a family here. We come together as the Perseverance family every day. But when we say the Our Father, we're saying this, that God, God is our Father. This is very much related to the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the gift of piety. The gift of piety. Our Father. So, God is our Father. Jesus Christ is our older brother. That means all of us are brothers and sisters in the one fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of Jesus Christ. And you might even say the motherhood of Mary Most Holy. So, given that we are a universal family... We should live out the last commandment of Jesus, which is love one another as I have loved you. That's the last and greatest commandment of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our, our Father. Our Father. And that, that also entails that if we are brothers and sisters, then we should live out that last commandment of the Lord. Love one another as I have loved you. Now, what is, what is this whole idea of love? What does love mean? Well, in theological terminology, we have the word charity. Charity, charity basically means this. Charity means this. Thomas Aquinas. Charity is... Willing the good of another. What is the greatest good we can will for, for another person? Well, on a human level, we say, well, long health, long life, and health, and prosperity, and happiness, and abundance in material possessions, and having a lot of friends. On a human level, that's usually what we would say. But let's go beyond the human level. Let's go into the the uh, a, a more spiritual interpretation. Willing the good of another, willing the good of another, would be willing his eternal salvation. Willing the eternal salvation of another is nothing greater. That's why myself as a priest, I pray especially for your eternal salvation. As Jesus himself said, What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and he loses his soul in the process? What can we exchange for our, for our salvation? So let's try to bond as a spiritual family. Now let's try to live out that last and greatest of all the commandments of Christ, to love one another as he loved us. By praying for each other, for our own conversion, our own sanctification, and our, our perseverance and grace. Because when all is said and done, my friends, 
when the curtain closes and the dust settles, as they say in poetic language, when all is said and done, really the only thing that matters is that we get to heaven. And Ignatius says we should not be attached to anything trying to live out holy indifference. We shouldn't prefer a long life to a short life. We shouldn't prefer rich uh, health over sickness. We shouldn't prefer riches over poverty. We shouldn't prefer honors over even humiliations. But we should desire God's will to glorify God as well as our eternal salvation. So we say, Our Father, all of us are brothers and sisters in Christ. And what militates against this Our Father, this universal family is could be jealousy, envy, rivalry, comparisons, racism, xenophobia. Yes. Yes, my friends. So all of us are brothers and sisters in Christ. I like the words of St. Paul. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's right. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So your success is my success. Your failure is my failure, especially on a moral and spiritual level. Let me explain that. Pope John Paul II and St. Therese say that when we do good spiritually, whenever we, do good, whenever we do something good spiritually, we're lifting up the whole world closer to our Heavenly Father. So every time you pray a fervent rosary, the whole world is being blessed. Every time you go to Mass and make a fervent communion, the whole world is being blessed. Every time you make an act of penance, the whole world is being blessed. Every time you say a fervent prayer with purity of heart, the whole world is being drawn closer to the Heavenly Father. But when we commit a sin, we're actually bringing the world down. So we want to be working to elevate the world Bring the world closer to our, our Heavenly Father. That's right. Our Father. We're our brothers and well, our Father. God is our Heavenly Father and all of us are brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Following up on this is our Father who art in heaven. Now what I like to say on this is the following. Heaven. Longing for heaven. That's right. We should have a real longing for heaven. My friends, if we, if we really, sincerely, honestly try to meditate, reflect more and more on the reality of heaven, what it is, what it consists of, how to get there, be much easier to carry the crosses and accept the sufferings that God allows us to undergo if we really had a more firm grasp on heaven and meditated upon it all the more. We should long for heaven. 
as the psalmist points out, as the psalmist points out, as the deer, as the deer yearns or longs for the running streams, so my soul yearns or longs for you, O Lord my God. I love that verse from Psalm 41. As the deer yearns or longs for the running streams, so my soul longs for you, O Lord, my God. My friends, we should really have a great longing for heaven. Longing for heaven. What is heaven like? St. Paul gives us an idea, very limited. But St. Paul says, I has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered in the mind of man the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who love him. We pray the Our Father we should have this greater longing for heaven. I has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered in the mind of man the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who love him. Eye is not he, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, nor has it entered into the mind of man the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who love him. And St. Paul also says, the sufferings of the present time are nothing in comparison with the glory that awaits the sons and daughters of God. So I think about heaven, my friends. Try to try to call the mind, so we can conjure up some idea of the joys of heaven. Conjure up. Conjure up. What do you think? was the happiest day, hour, minute, or even moment of your life. Okay, conjure up. Conjure up. What do you think was the greatest, the happiest day, hour, minute, moment of your life? Perhaps in the life of several of you, you are mothers, when you brought forth your first child and you saw the first smile on the face of your the little baby in your arms, that was probably a moment of great extraordinary joy that you experienced in that moment. Jesus says that when a woman brings forth a child, even though there is pain, he forgets the, the pain because he's brought forth a child into this world. Now think about the joy of that child in your arms and the smile, the joy you're experiencing. Magnify that a thousand times and forever and ever and ever and ever. In that you have a mere, a mere glimpse, a mere glimpse of, of heaven, just a mere glimpse, an open window. Even though, as most of you have already posted, it's uh, my birthday today or tomorrow in between. One of my friends said at midnight, I'll knock on your door and say happy birthday in between the 28th and the 1st. It falls about in that moment. But I have to say, in, in, in my life, um, I say the happiest day that I experienced was May 25th, 1986. I was in the Basilica of St. Peter's in Rome, and uh, John Paul II, St. John Paul II, placed his hands on my head and he prayed over me. That moment, of my ordination 
in that day would would be the happiest day in my life because I received the gift of holy orders, even though I'm not worthy. worthy. So that from that moment on, I could praise and worship the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit by celebrating the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And I could offer the Eucharist to you people. And also given faculties, I was able to to um, give absolution through the, the celebration of the sacrament of reconciliation. So that that day, May 25th, that hour, it was about 10.30, that place, St. Peter Basilica, that gesture, John Paul II, placing his hands on my head, would have been the, I would say, the happiest moment in my life. So, my friends, when we think about or praying the Our Father, when you're when we're praying the the Our Father, we should call to mind all the many joys and blessings that God has bestowed upon us. All the joys that God has bestowed upon us. So Adriana is greeting us from Chicago. Buenos dias. And um, so call to mind all God's blessings and to be thankful. My holy hour today, I was about an hour and a half, I was just thanking God for another year of life. Thanking God for another year of life and being just very, very grateful for the many graces and giftings that God has given me. So we want to be thankful to God. We're going through my friends who just come to us, Adriana, and we got Cecilia speaks parlez français, un petit peu, speaks French. We're thinking about, we're meditating upon the gospel for today. And the gospel for today is the gospel of the Our Father. We're going through the Our Father just a word at a time. So we start off by saying, Our Father. Our Father. When we say our Father, that means if God is our Father, He's the Father of all of us. All of us are brothers and sisters in Christ. And Jesus Christ is our older brother. We're in God's family. How good it is to be in God's family. How good it is to be in our family too. How, how grateful we should all be. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, hallowed means God's name is worthy to be praised. Let us praise the name of God. As St. Paul says, at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven, on earth, and below the earth should bow bow to the ground. Let's get the habit, my friends, get in the habit of praising the name of the Lord. The nuns taught us years in the past that upon hearing the name of Jesus, we make a bow. We should get in the habit of hearing the name of Jesus, making a bow, a bow, honoring his holy name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Let's talk a little bit about the kingdom. The kingdom of God. This is one of the most common expressions we have in the Gospels. Jesus says, be converted because the kingdom of God is at hand. 
Where is the kingdom of God? Many places. Ultimately, the kingdom of God is heaven where we're all destined to be one day. The kingdom of God is heaven. And as we said earlier, as the deer yearns for the running stream, so my soul yearns for you, O Lord my God. We should have a real yearning, a real longing, all of us, to, uh, to go to heaven. But there's another place, another interpretation of the kingdom of God. And that is, the kingdom of God also, my friends, you are the kingdom of God. Once we're baptized, once we're baptized, all of us are transformed into a living tabernacle of the Blessed Trinity, but also we are transformed into the kingdom of God. Now, when you go to Mass and receive Holy Communion, the body of Christ, amen, then you consume the body of Christ. Your tongue and your heart becomes the throne, the resting place of Jesus Christ, is, who is Lord of Lords and he's King of Kings. He's Lord of Lords and he's King of Kings. So the kingdom of God. Another place where we can say the kingdom of God is every time you go into the Catholic Church, wherever it might be, L.A., Taiwan, Chicago, and Africa, in the Philippines, wherever it might be, whenever you go into the Catholic Church, and you notice the, the red vigil lamp, right next to the red vigil lamp, you're going to see what is the tabernacle. The tabernacle. In that tabernacle, you, we have the consecrated hosts. The consecrated hosts. So the consecrated hosts that's God. That is the body, the blood, the soul, the divinity of Jesus Christ. So every time you go into church, the kingdom of God is present in the tabernacle. Jesus is present there as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. For that reason, we make what is called the genuflection. Genuflection, you go down to the ground on your right knee and you touch the ground. That's our manifestation of our belief that there in the church you have the kingdom of God, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Let's move on. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. My friends, very important. Dante Alighieri, in his spiritual masterpiece, which is called The Divine Comedy, says that in God's will is our peace. St. Maximilian Colby said that our sanctity depends upon capital W aligned to small w. Capital W is the will of God, small w is our will. So our sanctification and our happiness is trying to connect and to align God's will with our will. So let's pray on a daily basis that we are able to discern what is God's will. What is God's will and how can we put into practice God's will? 
I repeat, what is God's will and how can we put into practice God's will? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then our Lord says, and give us, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Actually, actually there are three interpretations. There are three interpretations. You see how, how intelligent our Lord is. When our Lord composed this prayer, he was definitely thinking about the whole person. So there's the physical or material interpretation of give us this day our daily bread. There is the biblical interpretation, and then there's the sacramental. Let's go through them. So when we say, give us this day our daily bread, we're begging the Lord in his infinite kindness and mercy and generosity to bestow upon us, to bestow upon us sufficient health in our body, in our mind. Sufficient health. So that by having sufficient health, all of us, God willing, are able to work, able to work hard. So that by working hard, we will be able to provide we'll be able to provide sufficient material means for our family to provide for food, clothing, and shelter for our family members. So in a certain sense, we're praying, give us this day our daily bread for health, health to work, to work so that we can provide. Then the other interpretation related more to the bread of the Word of God, we can make a parallel between that and the Gospel last Sunday. The first Sunday of Lent, we have the Gospel of the temptations of our Lord in the desert. The first temptation of Satan, he comes to Jesus after he's fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he tells Jesus to turn the stones into bread. What does Jesus say? He says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Our Lord is our Lord is giving proper priorities. Proper priorities. Let's make sure that we have proper priorities in our lives. We always put God first. So that is related to the bread of the Word of God that we want to come every day and spend time making our holy hour meditating upon the Word of God. Jesus said it very clearly, man does not live on bread alone, but every word that, that issues forth from the, from the mouth of God. Then the last interpretation we got a physical interpretation, a biblical interpretation, and now a sacramental interpretation. And that would be, that would be, we 
beg the Lord that he would give us the bread of life. That bread of life. There's a parallel between give us this day our daily bread and John chapter 6. John chapter 6 in the bread of life discourse Jesus says he says I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life and I will raise him up on the last day. May all of us have a real hunger. A real hunger for mass, holy communion, and the bread of life. Following give us this day our daily bread is, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The importance, my friends, of forgiveness and mercy. That's right, forgiveness and mercy. It is a two-way street. If you want to be forgiven by God, then we have to forgive others. It is a two-way street. For that reason, our Lord says, giving us an imperative, he says, be, mercy, be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. What were the first words that Jesus said on the cross? He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Then lead us not into temptation. We ask God to deliver us from temptation. St. Therese of Lisieux puts it this way. She says the only reason why I did not fall into sin like many other people in falling into serious sin St. Therese said is because God cleared the path. You know, I really like that. Don't you? God cleared the path. If you're walking down a sidewalk or a path and there's a lot of obstacles, there's a chance that you could trip over those obstacles. But if the, the path is cleared, it's going to be much easier to walk and to arrive at your, your destination. Let's ask God to pray for each other that God would clear the path so that we don't stumble and fall into sin. And then our Lord concludes the Our Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the literal translation would be, deliver us from the evil one. Who is this evil one? The evil one was the one that we encountered last Sunday. In the first reading, the ancient serpent that tempted Adam and Eve. And the devil that tempted Jesus Christ in the desert after 40 days fasting. So we're begging for the grace, begging for the grace not to be overcome by the tempter. 
St. Thomas Aquinas defines the devil as the tempter. So, I want to thank all of you. And the last word, what we should end with, the last word means amen. Amen? Which means every word that came forth from the mouth of Jesus Christ in the Bible and the Our Father, we say yes to it, we agree with it, and we want to try to understand it in our minds, and we want to try to apply it in our lives. So I'd like to thank all of you for your birthday wishes and blessings. And I, for my part, I will pray for all of you. All of you that God would bless you most abundantly today. So make sure that you take the Our Father today. And I've given you a pretty good explanation, dissecting the Our Father, explaining it word for word. You might even listen to my talk again, share my talk with someone else, so that you're able to understand and relish and love and live out the greatest of all prayers after the Mass, which is the prayer, the Lord's Prayer. It's called the Our Father. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it.